Well, good evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome to this evening's webinar presentation. I'm Jo Carruth, and I'll be your host for this evening. In previous uh, webinars, we've heard about the results of the most recent excavations at Clare Castle, which are taking part as a result of the successful Lottery Fund Award. But this evening, we're going to use the opportunity to examine the 10th and 12th century context of the castle and life in the castle in its 14th century heyday. We're very lucky to have two expert presenters, both of whom have long-standing and specialist knowledge of Clare Castle. Um, just a bit of housekeeping before we start. Um, the presentations are being recorded, but as attendees, your video is not on and you'll be muted during the webinar. But you can, you can interact with, the, with tonight's event in two ways. If you hover over your cursor towards the bottom of your screen, various icons will appear on, the, on your toolbar, including a chat box and a Q&A box. Um, we'd really like it if you use the chat box now just to say hello, say where, you come, where you've come from, because um, it's just really good. One of the great things about Zoom, which we've never had when we sort of go to places for real, um, is that we can get people from all over the country, sometimes even all over the world. So it'd be um, brilliant to know where you've come from, even if, you know, whether it's Claire or the United States or whatever. So I see someone already from the United States. Brilliant. Um, so that's great. The chat box, it'll only be open for a few minutes. Um, for this purpose and then we'll close it down and then later on you can use the Q&A box to type in any questions you may have and I'll just read selected questions out to our speakers in a Q&A session at the end of the presentations. Um, another thing that we've noticed is that when the presentation starts to be delivered you can maximize the viewing area by passing your cursor over the middle of the right hand side of the presentation and you should see two small pale vertical lines and if you drag those to the right That'll make the area of the presentation um, a bit bigger and minimise the hosting image. Um, so just to quick, just to see what we've got. Oh, um, someone based in Leicester, South Yorkshire. I saw some um, America, America coming up. I'm, I, hopefully there have been some people from Clare. I didn't quite notice, but um, come on. Yeah, Martin from Stroud. He attends everything. Um, West Sussex. Come on, someone from Clare. That's what we... Not that we've, we're obviously very pleased that everybody's coming in from West Sussex. Yes, thank you, Steve. <laughs> Steve from Clare, Sophie and Lee from Clare. That's great. Um, OK, so um, that, that's re it's really good just to see um, so many of you here. So our first speaker tonight is Carenza Lewis, and I'm sure she needs little introduction to anyone. She's well known for her many years on Time Team, and she's someone who's been a real champion of community archaeology. Her work on the CAUSE research project, that stands for Currently Occupied Rural Settlements, which has involved many communities, and especially in the East Anglian um, region, digging test pits and investigating their archaeology, and then feeding into this overarching research project, has completely changed the landscape for community archaeology and shown how, how it must be viewed in the future, not just as something where we we're entertaining an entertaining way to engage people with history, but actually making an invaluable contribution to our understanding of where we came from and how we've become the communities that we are today. She's now Professor of Public Understanding of Research at the University of Lincoln. And a special um, credit to Carenza, she's very kindly recorded this talk for us because of family circumstances that she will explain. And I would like to pass on our very great appreciation for her thinking of us when she has so much more important things on her mind. Um, and so now I just hand over and we will um, and we'll start the first presentation. Hello, good evening. My name is Carenza Lewis and I'm gonna be talking to you this evening about uh, castles, churches and the Clare Castle Cemetery. I'm really, really sorry I've had to pre-record this talk. I really intended to give it live and ideally have loved to have been able to come and give it in person in Clare, were that even possible right at the moment. Um, but unfortunately, um, I've had to pre-record it. We had a death in the family a couple of days ago and I just can't guarantee to be able to be free um, on Tuesday evening. So it seems safer to pre-record it. But I hope you'll enjoy what I'm going to talk to you about anyway, and I do hope to be able to be present um, for live questions after the talk. So 
Clare Castle, just a brief summary of some of the historical points um, uh, sort of running up to the Norman conquest and the 11th century. Um, there's a lot of history about it, which I'm not going to go into in any great detail at all. Um, there's a pre-conquest estate is documented. It's held by Earl Aylfric. Um, though it's not actually known whether his residence was at uh, the Clare Castle site or at uh, Erbury, uh, which is sort of uh, up at uh, Clare Camp. Um, in 1045, Aylfric founded a small collegiate monastery of St John. Um, this was um, gifted to the monks, but by 1086 was held by Richard Fitzgilbert, um, who was holding it off the king. Uh, the castle was built by 1090, and by then the uh, College of Priests was documented to be within the castle. In 1124, the monks were moved out of the castle site to Stoke by Clare. The earliest fabric of the present parish church of St Peter and St Paul, the Clare's main parish church, is uh, the 13th century tower. And then throughout the 20th century, um, there were rumours of human remains, bones being found within the castle bailey. So that's a very selective historical, uh, a few historical points about Clare, um, because it formed some of the background to the excavations that I directed in 2013 within the inner bailey of the castle at Clare. On the top right hand side here, you can see there's a map showing uh, the mot, the big urban mound that you can see in the photograph at the bottom of the page with the remains of the 12th century shell, shell keep on top of it. Um, that mot, it's, it, they're, they're very classic features of Norman castles, these big urban mounds, um, and it is generally thought that the uh, idea of building a big mound um, as part of the Lord's residence was introduced by the Normans at the conquest. Um, and you can see in the map at the top of the page of Clare, you've got the mound or mot, um, it's the circular feature with a black line around it. There was then an inner bailey, and the bailey is kind of the yard where you have most of your buildings, however big your mot mound is, uh, because of course it has to slope in um, uh, to simply be stable. By the time you get to the top, not very much space. And a castle needed to be entirely self-sufficient, really, in terms of uh, buildings and personnel. So it would need breweries and bake houses and stables and so on. And it would need uh, people there, servants, horses, uh, even some livestock. Um, so you need plenty of space. That's what the Bailey's for, is the kind of living space, usually. Um, Clare is unusual in having two baileys. It also has an outer bailey, and you can see that outlined at the top of the map on the top right hand side of the page. Now, in 2013, um, we carried out what well, we did four excavation trenches. You can see them marked on the map there A, B, C, and D. Um, a was aimed to, was located where it was, to investigate the site where human remains had been found in 1951 when a way bridge for the railway line that had been built through the castle in a bailey um, had, uh, the, the, the way bridge had been built in association with that. Um, and in fact, you can see the line of the railway line, which comes from where the label says gardens up moving across the site. Uh, through where it says B. Um, this is a Victorian railway line, which is no longer in use, of course. So Trench A was located on the site where the local paper had photographs of these bones being discovered. Um, and then Trench B was sited right on the line of the railway, as you can see, um, really to assess whether there was anything left there at all. Uh, we strongly suspected that the railway would have destroyed pretty much all of the archaeology in that area. And in fact, uh, we were surprised to discover very few human remains in Trench A by the Weybridge. Um, a few bits of human bone, disarticulated, just loose single bones, not in position in a grave. 
Entrenched B, on the other hand, while the upper deposits, and in the photograph at the top of the page, you can see the vertical ranging pole, the red bit at the top more or less marks the depth of the railway deposits, and you can see that orangey gravel there, part of the hardcore for the railway. Um, but below that, the archaeology was fairly much intact, and there was about 20 or 30 centimetres with very little in it at all. And then we came down onto a surface which then had some cuts in it, which you can see um, where the, the white bit of the ranging pole is going into. And these turned up, if you can just look at the uh, sort of left hand edge of the photograph, you can see the two little parallel lines there. And the close up at the bottom of the page there shows they are two human legs and feet showing the uh, legs from the knee down and the foot bones there. Um, now, it was only a small part of one skeleton, um, but skeletons, of course, are very predictable. If you found the feet, you know where the rest of it's going to be. And we could tell just from that short bit that this skeleton had probably been laid on its back and that it was orientated east-west with its head to the west. Um, and that immediately looks like a Christian burial. So we didn't have any uh, secure dating evidence from that. We had a bit of uh, Thetford type pottery, which could be 10th or 11th century, a bit of early medieval sandy ware, which could be a little bit later, 12th century, perhaps 13th. Um, but of course that could have got in at, at any time. So we then came back for another excavation in the autumn of the same year. And all of these excavations were community digs carried out by um, members of the public living in and around Clare. So we came back to excavate Trench E. Um, and here you can see a close up of that map, that map of Clare at the top of the page, showing the castle mound um, with a sort of circular spiral path leading up to it. And then in the red square, you can see there's our old trench B is marked on the right. And then the new trench E is marked just to its left. So we wanted to see if there were any further inhumations. Was this just one separate burial that we found in trench B or were there going to be any others? And this was really important because the trench B burial had been the first in situ burial, the first burial in a grave in its original position. All of the other bones that were known to have been found from within the Bailey at Clare had been these disarticulated random bones just sort of loose in the soil. So we excavated a larger trench and as you can see in the photograph here, we did indeed find more burials. Um, there are three skeletons showing here in the trench. Um, there's one on the left hand side that's fairly complete. You can see it's got a head, a body and legs and you can see it's lying in a grave cut. There's then another skeleton in the middle of the picture um, which is missing its head. And all we have got before we got to the edge of the trench is essentially its shoulders, uh, rib cage, spine and arms down to just below the elbow. Um, and then on the very right hand side of the page, uh, you can uh, photograph that. You can just see a little bit of um, uh, white stuff going into the section there. And that is a very small amount of a human pelvis. Now, although those burials weren't very uh, complete in two cases, um, they were essentially in situ, and as you can see, they're all laid out parallel with each other. And just like the other burial that we'd found in our trench B, they were lying on their backs with their heads to their west and their feet to the east. Again, the Christian layout. And you can see also that they're laid out parallel to each other. They're respecting each other. Um, and you can see this a little bit more clearly, perhaps, in the uh, site plan here. You can see the entire burial is one where we have the little northern extension to get the rest of it. Um, and the other two are more piecemeal. But then in this area inside the red circle, we had a lot of bits of sort of what looked like building rubble, possibly footings for buildings. Um, and if we look back at the photograph, you can see that white spread of material in the centre of the uh, photograph there that's sort of dipping down 
looked like perhaps the footings of the clunch wall or something, or the remains of that perhaps. So we could see we had all these, these sort of features that looked as if they might be something to do with buildings. Um, when we took all that material off, what we found below that, and this uh, plan at the bottom of the page is exactly that same bit of the trench, um, but it's a lower layer. And you can see here within that red circle, so this is exactly the same bit of the trench as the upper level, then the lower level. Within that lower level, we had a whole series of post holes, which are the circular features, you can see that. And on the photograph, you can see here, those circular features are outlined in a white dotted line there. Um, and also running broadly parallel with a small beam slot trench as well. And of course, there's that white material that you can see as the remains of another sort of building. So it looks as if we've got potentially three different phases of building here. One uh, built of large posts, perhaps, perhaps about the size of telegraph poles, uh, going into the ground, earth fast poles. Now that's quite a good way of getting a building to stand upright if you uh, wedge your poles into holes in the ground. Problem is, of course, they rot out very quickly, so they tend to need replacing. So maybe uh, that line, that linear feature running parallel with the line of post holes, uh, maybe a beam slot that was a footing that was then used to build a framed timber building. And then again, we've got this possible remains of the uh, chalky clunch building. Now, obviously, these are very close to the uh, skeletons. They're in broadly the same orientation. Again, the, the lines of the post holes and the lines of that Beam slot feature are running uh, again in the same orientation as the skeletons, east west. Um, the most obvious explanation for that is that it's a church, um, because we would, in a Christian burial, you would usually have a church or a chapel associated with it. But of course, we haven't got very much remaining of it there. And of course, there's now um, further excavations taking place, um, of which the third year delayed by COVID, sadly, of course, the third season of excavations is just about to start uh, in September 2021. Um, but the two seasons of excavations that took place in 2018 and 19 before COVID struck, um, part of those excavations were intended to try and find out how big is this cemetery, because what we had already established from the work we did um, in 2013 was that it clearly wasn't just adult males who were buried there. Um, and that's what we'd expect if it had just been that college of priests I mentioned that Aylfric founded. Um, it wasn't just adult males, therefore that suggests it might be a uh, a family cemetery, perhaps of a lord, or it could be a parish cemetery. Um, and one way of trying to establish which of those it might be is to find out how big it is. Um, the excavations by Cotswold Archaeology in 2018 and 2019, I'm just using some of their words here from their reports, um, in each of the five trenches over a substantial area of Inner Bailey, burials were found. So it's clearly a really large cemetery and it's sufficiently big that that again also makes it unlikely it's just to do with that college of priests, secular canons. Um, and again, not all of those burials are male and not all of them are adults. So we've got children and we've got females as well. Furthermore, the radiocarbon dating suggests many of them may be pre-Norman. They may actually predate the founding of that College of Priests. And then there was also a large palisaded enclosure ditch in the trench closest to the uh, goods shed, which you can see the building in the background there. Um, that seemed to be earlier than any of the demolition debris or any of the possible structures. So we've perhaps got a big palisaded a ditch with a fence on top of it um, that's then overlaid perhaps by a cemetery and any buildings associated with it. So we seem to have a church and its associated cemetery inside a castle. Now, this is quite interesting. So what I want to talk to you now about is kind of how common or unusual this might be. Because over the period when I was working at the University of Cambridge and doing a lot of excavation, community excavations um, in uh, the area, not too far from Clare, 
we found this association kept cropping up in excavation. So a couple of years before digging at Clare, we had done some work at Mount Beers, um, which it, well, you can see it marked on the map with the red dot there. Um, so it's not very far from Clare. Um, and the uh, archaeology here is another big mound. The photograph at the bottom is, it looks just perhaps a bit like a hill, but actually that's an artificial man-made mound. You can see the steps running up it, which are obviously man-made. Um, to the left of it, just in the corner, just part hidden behind the trees there, you can see the spire of the church. And the aerial photograph at the top of the page shows that circular mound at the top there, covered in trees, and the building you can see casting the shadow is again that church. So this, like Clare, is a very large mound, in fact. But Mount Beers has much less history known about it. Um, the estate is recorded in Doomsday Book as Bura. Um, it's been suggested that doesn't refer to a burr, a sort of defended enclosure. It refers to a bower. We don't know. Um, the first reference to the, the mount is in the 14th century. There's no known bailey there, of course. If that mound was going to be a castle mot, it needs a bailey. It has been suggested that the bailey may have actually been the churchyard. And if you look at the map here, you can see there's that circular mound um, circled in red there. And you can see just immediately below that, there's the graveyard there. Um, I've just highlighted that in the square there. Uh, so that may have been the bailey, it's been suggested. And of course, if it was, then the church was inside it. So we did some, uh, we were just showing you, again, you've got another picture here showing the um, churches on slightly higher ground, the earliest fabric of the church dates to the 12th century. And you can see how close the church is to the mound in the long picture at the bottom of the page there. So the church is very obvious in the centre and that urban mound is just behind the green tent on the right hand side. So you can see they're closely sighted together. And here again, you can see the map shows the mound at the top of the page, St John's Church in the middle, and then the current site of Mount Viewers Hall immediately uh, to the south of the church, below the church. So you've got the hall and the church very close together, and they're both close to this mound. Now, the hall is 16th century, it's a lot later, but it hints at a possibility of continued use of the site as a seigneurial, a lordly, a high status residence. So we did some excavations there in 2011. We did a big L-shaped trench on top of the mound to try and see if there are any buildings there or any dating evidence or anything that might tell us what it was used for. And then we did a series of test pits, um, just one metre square excavations around the bottom of the mound, uh, the Mott Mound, to try and find out what was going on there. And I've just highlighted test bit 10 and test bit 8 at the bottom of the page there, shown by arrows, um, which are the two that were closest to the church. And remember, of course, that that square churchyard is suspected uh, by some to be the uh, area of the castle bailey, if that mound was a mot. Now, we did quite a big, or rather, we did an excavation that covered a, probably about a third of the top of the mot. We found no trace for any buildings at all. We found two very shallow post holes, which didn't look structural. They might have been part of the building of the mot, but they're certainly not part of a tower or anything like that that might have been on top of the mot as a residential building or even a lookout tower. Um, and in fact, we sieved um, all of the spoil that came out of that reasonable sized trench and found a grand total of seven sherds of medieval pottery. So we're pretty confident that that mound wasn't being lived on in the medieval period. On the other hand, by huge contrast, the uh, test pit, test pit eight, immediately south of the church, and again, that's the map that you can see, and the location of the test pit is shown as that black square. It's not to scale, but I wanted to make it big enough for you to be able to see it. Um, and at the bottom of that post hole, we found a red burnt clay floor, which you can see in the photograph at the bottom of the page. And then that was cut through by a large pit or post hole. Um, that was feature 20. And the reason that's significant is because when you look at the table at the bottom of the page, uh, you might be able to see context 20 at the bottom has got not only 11 sherds of medieval ware, so we had more sherds of medieval pottery from that one metre square pit than we had from the whole of the top of the mound. 
but also um, it had a piece of theft where which goes back potentially as early as 900 AD. So we've got a building, a burnt floor, which appeared to be a hearth and a building made of a post that would have been within that post hole. And then the other test pit near, well, on the line of that suspected bailey, um, again, you can see the location of that in the map at the top there, also had large amounts of medieval pottery, considerably more total of uh, three, four, five, six, six, seven sherds of medieval pottery coming from that one test pit, as many as we'd had from the whole of the top of the mound. So it looks from this as if actually the suggestion that there was a bailey um, that included the church seems to be more likely uh, from the excavation because we've got evidence of a large building built with that post hole. We've got habitation, we've got burning, we've got a hearth. It looks as if that may well have been a modern bailey castle, just that there was no building on top of the mound. So another site we looked at, again, not too far away from Clare, is Saffron Walden, 2013. Um, we were digging uh, here, there's a, a medieval town laid out there. Um, the town originated, um, or there's an Anglo-Saxon town there, in fact, uh, just where that green area is. And again, there was a cemetery found there um, where the red cross is within the green area. Um, and then after the Norman conquest, the Norman Lord there built a castle um, uh, with an inner bailey, which you can see marked as the small sort of oval shape uh, labelled inner bailey. Um, there's a uh, 11th century castle keep in the middle of it. Um, and there's then also a church, the same sort of date, um, just to the um, west of it. And in fact, you can see the church is actually very much lined up on the church, it's orientated on the castle, in fact. And then there's an outer bailey, that sort of uh, sub-rectangular uh, black dotted line, dashed line, is the line of an outer bailey, which enclosed both the castle and the church and the 12th century town. And then in the 13th century, there's a much bigger square town is laid out, but that's not particularly relevant right now, because what we were looking at is the area in red here, um, where we did a trench across the uh, corner of that outer bailey, which we uh, found in geophysics. Uh, I'll just highlight that in red for you so you can see the line of that. And in the trench that uh, returned back uh, around the south side of the outer bailey. Um, so trench two here, you can see that marked on the map at the top of the page there. So trench two is cut across the line of that outer bailey. And we found mid 12th century pottery, a cluster of it, you can see it in the finds tray there, right at the bottom of the trench, in fact, in that hole at the bottom of the trench. So we definitely know that that outer bailey dates to the 12th century, so within less than 100 years after the Norman Conquest. Remember, that's enclosing the church and the castle and the town all together. And then there is Nayland again, not too far from Clare. Um, and Nayland um, is a very different sort of place in many respects. Um, it's uh, right down in the bottom of the valley, it, it, rather like the Clare site is, actually Clare Castle site is, is in the bottom of the valley, very different to the site of Mount Bures, very different to the site of uh, Saffron Walden. Um, there's uh, Nayland again is not extensively recorded. Um, it uh, Knoll has always been assumed to mean round top mound or hill. Um, that doesn't really work with the name of the site. It has been suggested it might come from the Anglo-Saxon word knill, which is the sound of a ringing a bell, like a, a, a knell of a bell. Um, the church again is a little bit later, 14th century, but actually wasn't a, a parish church um, until much, much later. Um, we did some test pitting in Nayland, and here's the map of the area. The church at Nayland is shown in, as the Red Cross, and there's relatively little Anglo-Saxon pottery um, shown by grey circles on this map. Um, the settlement really seems to grow after the conquest. You can see the map on the right hand side here it shows all of the circles there are showing test bits that are producing pottery of 12th to 14th century date, so after the Norman conquest. <laughs> 
The site of interest, though, in this context is Court Knoll, um, which I've just put a red circle on so you can see where that is. Um, now, we didn't do any test pitting near it, but the test pitting stirred up a long standing interest, um, and the local uh, residents then got together and did some geophysical survey of it. It picked out um, both an oval within that enclosure, which might just be a, a, a mock mound or perhaps a, a smaller enclosure within the larger one. Uh, and then it also picked up the, the little square arrangement there of a building that had been excavated previously. Um, so between 2014 and 2016, um, there were some excavations were done. Uh, well, the geophysical survey was done, and then some excavations in 2016. Um, uh, and as you can see, there are seven trenches excavated within that sort of subsquare uh, court knoll enclosure. Um, you can see them laid out there. Now, there was a lot of optimism <clears throat> that this uh, feature was going to turn, particularly the cruciform feature, was going to turn out to be a church. And I have to confess, I was very uh, doubtful about this uh, at the time. Um, trench one uh, was sort of over the apsidal, the curved end of the building. Um, but when you actually look at it, you can see it's clearly later than the uh, main uh, bit of the church. Um, and it's circular rather than hemispherical. So it's not a curved apse end of a church. It looks like a freestanding circular building. It might be a dovecote or something. But just at the point I came down to visit the excavations um, uh, that were being done by Suffolk Archaeology then, um, I came down to visit the excavations on the last day, uh, by which time pretty much all the digging was finished. They found lots of building, been fantastically recorded. An amazing cake had been made um, showing the excavations. You can see the curved bit of the building and the square bit picked out beautifully on the cake. Um, and just as we were eating cake, what should turn up in the bottom of Trench 7, which was pretty much the only one that was going. Trench 1 had been where all the buildings had turned up. The bottom of Trench 1, there we are, another pair of legs. Um, exactly the same as those first ones we found in Trench B at Clare, uh, a little bit further up the leg, because there's the uh, femur as well as the uh, tibia and fibula. Um, uh, but leg bones, again, orientated east to west, lying on its back, head to the west Christian style burial. So no further digging was possible at that point, but it does look as if there is some burials there, in which case there may well be a church or chapel. And in many ways, they, uh, they, it now looks from an analysis of other finds as well, as if there is actually quite a high status church based on the uh, uh, ornateness of the roof tiles that were found. So lordly residents then and sacred sites might seem very separate, but actually they're very closely connected. At Clare, we have that community cemetery probably it's too big to be anything other than a community cemetery associated with large post-built structures maybe a church maybe a palisade maybe both um, all enclosed within the 11th century castle bailey the cemetery goes out of use for the 12th century after which those castle burials are slighted by subsequent buildings that's why those buildings are missing their heads and so on because later buildings damage them the parish church appears at the other end of the marketplace by the 13th century. At Mount Bures, there's a large pre-Norman domestic structure immediately adjacent to the church, or perhaps within the bailey, um, from the evidence of the test pits. At Saffron Walden, again, we've got an Anglo-Saxon cemetery that's abandoned when the castle is built with a church orientated on it, all of which is enclosed by the outer bailey, which encloses the church the castle and the town. And then at Nayland, we've got this 11th century, possibly earlier ringwork, including a cemetery and an ornate church. And that's just a few examples that I happen to have been associated with. I now live in Lincoln. Um, and in fact, um, the uh, digging not very long ago, probably not much longer after uh, after we were at Clare, um, when uh, some construction work was being done within the castle um, for the new Magna Carta vault and the wall walk, um, uh, discovered a late Anglo-Saxon cemetery, including one very high status one in a stone coffin, as you can see here. Um, and there are other examples, in fact, so Pontefract Castle, for example, um, the excavation there has shown that the Norman earthwork ramparts actually contain, contained huge amounts of disarticulated human bone from the Anglo-Saxon cemetery. 
and uh, Lizzie Craig Atkins has done a review of some of these sites where you've got castles with cemeteries within them. Um, and uh, she, she uh, quotes another account here. This is Hereford Castle, which actually talks about a 12th century siege where, uh, as you can read here, the earth of their kinsfolk graveyard was being heaped up to form a rampart. And they could see across like the bodies of parents' relations, some half rotten, some quite lately buried, pitilessly, pitilessly dragged from the depths. So there's that sense of these cemeteries. They're there, they're within the castles, they're being disturbed, they're not being treated with respect. And this is what we see to some extent at Clare. So to summarise there, Norman castles frequently do encompass pre-existing cemeteries. Uh, these might be from a monastic site, and some of the burials at Clare may be the monastic ones, but certainly there are too many for all of them to be that. It may be from a burr, an Anglo-Saxon town, and that seems to be what we've got at Clare. Or it may be a thane's defended enclosure. And again, we may have that at Clare. We may have all three together rather like there is at Saffron Walden. Um, we have references to these Thanes defended enclosures, these burr gates, enclosure gates, um, where there's a references to what a Thanes enclosure should have is a church and a kitchen, a bell and enclosure date, seat, special office, and so on, in the formal kind of list of Thanes attributes. And in the Pontefract Castle excavation report, in fact, it refers to this growing corpus of evidence for modern Bailey castles reusing earlier Saxon defended enclosures. So what seems to be going on here is that either side, both sides of the Norman conquest, lords are taking care to associate their residences with churches and chapels and their associated burial grounds because this is a way of validating their secular power by connecting that to religious authority, by physically co-locating Thane's residences or the Lord's residences with the church and chapel or and cemetery. And after 1066, the behaviours that we see towards churches and cemeteries are both, they're important statements of both continuity and change. So that sacred power of place is being harnessed, it's being taken over, it's kind of being respected because it's being continued as a sacred place. But the secular power of the people who'd held that place previously is of course being transferred to a new family, a new dynasty, and so the personal identity, identity of those previous incumbents can actually be disrespectfully neutralised by not treating the cemetery with respect to the sacred site. You might build a new church, but you're not respecting the previous burials. No one is messing around with churches and cemeteries. It's much more calculating than that, I would suggest. And so what's going on at Clare? Well, we know from the test pit digging that we did in Clare in 2011, and this again shows the black and grey circles, show where pottery of 9th to 11th century dates, so Anglo-Saxon pottery, shows where that came from within Clare. And we can see that it's uh, rarely uh, in the area north of the castle and a little bit to the uh, west as well. Um, so what we seem to have here, I think, is an existing uh, large community that clearly is extending north of the castle site. It may well be there was a family enclosure on the site of the castle with its associated um, church and cemetery, uh, perhaps also with a college of priests. Um, the college of priests perhaps is respected until it's moved, but the uh, cemetery site, the, the, which may have been the community cemetery or may have been the family cemetery of the Lord, is not respected in the later building. So I hope that gives you a little bit of different perspective on those human remains at Clare Castle. Thank you very much. Thank you, Corenza. That's absolutely fascinating. And I'm, I'm sure everybody, I mean, certainly everybody who, who's, who's been involved in the excavations at Clare really appreciates the opportunity to see it in that wider context and to, under, to get some sort of understanding of what it is that we're finding and how that fits into a much broader pattern of what was going on in the 11th century. Um, I've certainly got some questions um, and, and there are other questions coming in, um, but we'll, we'll move to our next presentation and take questions at the end. Um, but thank you very much for that, Corenza, and, and I can see what we need to focus on this year. We're gonna find that church. Um, so we're now going to hear from um, Peggy Smith, who's going to talk to us about um, Lady Elizabeth de Burr, who's 
Um, Claire, we call her Claire's most illustrious resident, present company accepted, of course. Um, Peggy, just a little bit about Peggy. She's a retired reader in book design history at the University of Reading and currently the honorary curator of, um, of Clare Ancient House Museum, as well as Clare, Castle's, Clare Castle Country Parks, representative on the archaeological digs with her husband, Richard Smith. She's authored a number of booklets about the history of Clare. And I can tell you that as the project manager for the excavations um, in the castle, I can tell you that Peggy's knowledge and enthusiasm and complete commitment to the project has been a really important part in its, in its success. So I'm really looking forward um, to hearing what Peggy's going to tell us about, about um, Lady Elizabeth de Burr. Um, so over to you, Peggy. Um, thank you, Jo. Um, I'm going to now take us um, somewhat later than Carenza's period. And I'm going to start with um, a, a general outline about uh, Elizabeth de Burr. And then I'll spend a little bit of time talking about how it is she came to be the longest medieval resident in Clare Castle and then return again to Elizabeth. <clears throat> this is um, um, the most important uh, portrait of Elizabeth, but I'm going to give you now um, a, bit, a, a brief chronology. She's the fourth child of Gilbert de Clare, who was Earl of Gloucester and Earl of Hartford, and his wife, Joan of Acre, born in 1295. She married at 13, or was married at 13 by the, uh, the king, to John de Burgh, who was heir to the earldom of Ulster. They had one son, William, born in 1312, um, and John de Burgh died in 1313. Then uh, she was married again. This time um, she eloped with Theobald de Verdun um, against the wishes of King Edward II. Um, and by Theobald, she had one daughter. But Theobald didn't last very long. Um, and shortly after uh, the daughter was born, um, Edward II had her married to Roger Damery in 1317. They had one, one daughter. From, it was from 1317 that she owned Clare Castle and Manor. <clears throat> she was widowed in 1322, just at the moment that her husband had been declared traitor for um, being against Edward II. Um, and when, because he was declared traitor, Clare Manor and Castle were briefly um, confiscated uh, returned to her somewhat later that year. She made her first donation to a college in Clare called University Hall in 1336. She continued to make uh, other donations so that shortly thereafter, um, it changed its name to uh, Clare Hall. It was much later that it became Clare College. In the 1330s and 40s, she founded um, a Franciscan hostel for poor pilgrims at Walsingham. Walsingham. This was against the wishes of the Dominicans who were already running the um, very important Marian shrine at Walsingham. During the Black Death, she sp actually spent two years in her castles in Wales, especially the castle at Usk. She died in 1360. And she was buried in the Minories, which was a Franciscan nunnery in London, where she had built herself a grand house. Unfortunately, both the grand house and her tomb and the nunnery burned down <clears throat> at some time since then. I'm going to talk a little bit about the de Clare family now and how it is they came to have so much land. Um, the Declares started with the Norman cousin of um, William the Conqueror named Richard um, Fitzgilbert or Richard de Bienfet. And this is part of the doomsday entry. You'll see the name Clare, Clarum has been underlined there with the arrow. And this um, was the beginning of the great Declare estates. It was, uh, Richard was given the Clare Manor about 1375, along with many, many other estates, 95 um, manors in Suffolk alone, as well as um, manors in Essex and Kent. Uh, 
Richard made Claire the seat of his East Anglian um, lands, especially, and it was came to be known as the honor of Claire. Claire then remained in the family between the 12th and 14th centuries. But once um, the earldom of Gloucester had come to the, to the declares, um, they acquired a great many more lands. Um, this happened just after Richard de Clare, another Richard de Clare. Um, the Richards, the de Clares were either called Gilbert or Richard. Um, so it takes a while to sort them all out. Um, one of the Richards and his son Gilbert were among the magnates who uh, forced King John to agree to uh, Magna Carta in 1215. And this is my favorite 19th century image of, of that event because it includes the um, one of the nobles with the declare arms on the far left of the image. But in 12th, 17, um, the, the Clares came into the very large earldom of Gloucester. And at this point, um, their interests were moved west toward the marches and the West Country. Now, having many estates meant that uh, there was much traveling around um, between the estates. And we have actually relatively little evidence, hardly any, of how often the family um, lived at Clare. The honor was of course run by administrators. Um, and we do know that it's possible that in the late 12th century, Richard, one of the Richard de Clares may have been responsible for building the stone keep on top of the mott. Now, this very law, I said that the, the estate basically stayed in the Declare family um, until the 14th century. It was in the 14th century. Um, by that time, uh, one of the scholars that's worked on the Declare family has um, claimed that the, the Gilbert the Red Declare was the richest non noble in England. But the last male declare heir, what, the last male heir declare, um, a rich, uh, another Gilbert, died at the Battle of, of Bannockburn. And you'll see in, in the image, this by the historical um, artist Mark Cherms, that Gilbert declare um, with the red chevrons on a, a yellow background is, is at the left of the picture. And interestingly enough, at the far right of the picture, a little bit farther back, is Richard de Burgh, who was Earl of Ulster, who was um, married to Gilbert de Clare's um, sister, which is our Elizabeth de Burgh. Gilbert, the last male heir, died at the Battle of Bannockburn in 1314. He had no heirs and that the estate was um, divided between his three sisters, but not uh, uh, until 1317. Um, the story is, was that his, his, his widow claimed that she was pregnant, a rather long pregnancy. But um, it certainly suited Edward II to have the income from the estate while um, uh, it was yet to be settled on the three sisters. So Elizabeth Berg is one of the three sisters uh, and she is the one who gets Claire Manor and Castle. Although it's only at one third of the de Clare estates, she was still ranked among the richest people in England, not just the richest women, but one of the richest people in England at the time. Now she too traveled around her estates um, as I've already mentioned, she decamped to Wales for two years during the Black Death. We know that she was responsible for at least three buildings in the Priory, although this comes from literary evidence about 100 years after her death. She built their dormitory, their um, 
dining hall and their chapter house. She may also have built in the castle. We certainly know that she repaired um, buildings in the castle from her very large um, estate records, which are now in the National Archives. And I have to apologize that this may not particularly uh, be particularly easy to read. Um, but it does show that there were repairs to the roof of her great chapel, cham chamber, the great chamber, and repairs to the chapel windows in, in the period 1324 to 13, 20, uh, 1305. She may have also built, have made other buildings, but we don't uh, yet have a evidence from the, from the estate records. I'm going to talk about this in a minute, but I'll just mention briefly um, that she was really a, a remarkable woman, um, a, an intellectual. Um, she was friends with various um, English theologians, especially Thomas Bradwardine. And she was extremely forward thinking on, on the issue of education. As I mentioned, she refounded the Cambridge College, which became Clare Hall eventually Clare College. And she left a large number of books in her will, uh, left, to the, left them to the college. Now, uh, her remarkable records, which I've already mentioned briefly, is a very large archive in the National Archives. Um, and it's largely about running her household and the manor um, and other properties. Now, account rolls are very revealing about her travels, and all her visitors and various expenditures. And um, on the screen at the moment is um, an image from uh, what, one of the diet accounts. And it, had, it relates to the visit of King Edward III. There are relatively few visits by the kings re among the records. Um, and this was a three day visit. This, this particular one shows <clears throat> what was spent for him the third day of his visit. And I'm taking the opportunity to um, use part of the translation by um, Jennifer Ward in her recent Suffolk Records Society volume about these records. This particular day, <clears throat> there were 163 messes and messes usually translates as a, um, a, a dish that was a meal for two to four people. So the number of messes recorded doesn't exactly give us how many people sat down to, the, to, to, to eat together. There were 480 loaves of bread, 224 gallons of ale, 18 cider, 12, roughly 12 bottles of wine. The meat included beef, bacon, deer, pigs, mutton, lamb. The fish included herring, stockfish, cod, mullet, eels, poultry, swans, herons, hens, Bullets, doves, and I'm sorry, sorry to say bitterns. And um, also recorded was the, the upkeep for 160 horses, 30, 13 hackneys, and five oxen. And then the wages for the grooms and the various people who looked after the horses. And all, all together, we have a cash expenditure <clears throat> of over seven pounds. I'm going to stop now with showing you um, the arms that Clare College uses, which are developed from the um, personal arms of Elizabeth de Clare, um, also known as Elizabeth de Berg. Um, and my final slide shows you uh, the new biography or the new edition of the recent biography edited by a Clare College alumna Claire Barnes came out in 2020, much expanded from the original um, 1999 um, edition. And it is um, now illustrated with several appendices and a plug for uh, the, my new booklet that's currently in press, which details the different owners of, uh, of Claire Castle from the conquest to the present. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Peggy, for that. That's um, fascinating. And, um, it, you know, it's it just really interesting. Again, we see um, that we see how the ex what we're finding in the excavations fits in with with these little these sort of well it's not even snippets of information that we get with um with elizabeth de Burr because the records are so good but uh are things like talking about the 480 loaves and of course we've got those those big ovens out in the outer bailey and talk about the horses and of course we've got all the the horseshoes so it's it, you know it, it's really nice it, it's really good to see how all this evidence interweaves um to tell to tell the whole story or or a bigger part of the story um and i was also um i have to say you know, i have to say this we're on hot in hol on holiday in devon this um this summer and we visited cleave cleave abbey which has a fantastic medieval tiled floor and what do you know there we saw the there we saw the coat of arms for the for the claire the claire coat of arms and so to walk into there and just and see oh you recognize that i you know recognize that that heraldry was um was it really you know you felt like you were sort of almost coming home um sort of all all that way away so um anyway um enough of me rambling but um thank you to to both our speakers for giving us such interesting and pertinent talks and it, and it to me anyway it just goes to emphasize what a an important site this is and how the archaeology has has the power to inform what we're getting from these other other pieces of information and how we should be looking at it in the whole we're not just what's happening in our trenches but how that relates to the documentary how that relates to the patterns in the in the other towns um so um so i've really enjoyed it i'm sure you know all our um everybody who's listening has 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 got as much out of it as i have um, I've got various things to raise in both the chat and the Q and A. And you'll have to apologize. I'll have to apologize if I do this incredibly incompetently, because it's quite possible that I will uh, that I'll pick the wrong things. Um, and some of them, I think, have kind of been addressed in in the questions, but per, in the talks. But perhaps there's no harm in reiterating some things. Um, so, for example, um, Neil Neil Langridge asks. Are there, is, is there evidence from other counties of churches associated with Mots? And I know you've sort of touched on this, Carenza, but it would be really interesting to know how widespread um, you think this pattern is and how it and does it in any way. Do we see a different pattern depending on um, does it relate it? What I'm, I suppose what I'm trying to say is does it relate in any way at what point Anglo-Saxon England regained before the Norman conquest? Yeah, okay. Can you hear me? Just yes. checking. Yes, great. Thank um, you for joining us. <laughs> no, no, it's a bit complicated, but um, I'm really glad to be with you. Um, yeah, no, it's a really common pattern, actually, and I cut out about three other examples just to try and get the talk down to something vaguely approaching a sensible length. Um, and I think, actually, the more we look, uh, the more we tend to find them. So there have been excavations at places like uh, Trowbridge Castle, for example, in Wiltshire, which turned up a unexpected cemetery during excavation that was some time ago but it sort of exemplifies the fact that this this does happen even when they're not known about quite often Mott and Bailey castles are quite close to existing churches uh, rather like at Mount Beers if there is a Mott and Bailey there um, where you've got that that very close location with a church that's continued on as a church um, but in many other cases they've been lost and there are also lots of examples where you've got manorial sites so the next sort of step down the hierarchy if you like um, which I suppose Nayland is, is an example of that um, uh, it is not a royal castle like Clare um, but there are lots of examples of these sort of manorial enclosures that are again very close to churches and there's a great example and there's numerous examples all over the place but one that I cut out of my talk uh, that I did have in it earlier is um, uh, Buslingthorpe in Lincolnshire where there's a big sort of semi sub square moated enclosure right next door to the parish church and the two are clearly you know the, 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 the moss is actually at the east end of the church and uh, the, the, the uh, moated enclosure it's right at the east end of the church so this seems to be something that filters down through the hierarchy if you like from the kind of major castles uh, into the 12th century when you've got that association 
uh, continuing in the sort of slightly lower state of status castles like Saffron Walden. Um, and then there seems to be a bit of a separation out after I think the 12th century, once you get into 13th century, the church as an institution has sort of gained slightly more control of parish churches. Um, there's much more emphasis by then, you know, you have to be buried in parish church and, and, and so on. And the um, uh, Pope Gregory is a very effective reformer in the, in the 12th century, sort of bringing uh, the church much more powerfully uh, independent. And this is all tied in with the story of, you know, Henry II and Thomas of Becket and that sort of thing, you know, this conflict between church and crown, between secular and religious authority starts to separate out a little bit once you get beyond the 12th century. Um, but yes, I mean, I think if people want to go and have a look at modern Bailey castles that they know and see how many of them are close to churches, and then if they can find any of the excavation reports, see if there's any evidence of human remains turning up. And if there hasn't been, I would be I would be prepared to put a, I'm not a betting person, but I'd be prepared to put a little bit of money on the fact that actually most modern bailey castles may well have burials in the bailey if it was it was mainly big enough they would all have had chapels in the bailey and they've probably got burials with them thank you thank you i think that's a very full answer for Sorry. that <laughs> no 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 that's good no that's good that's what we want <laughs> we're all here because we want to we want to know more <laughs> um i've got um a question for peggy also, this is from Rachel. Was there any evidence to suggest that Elizabeth de Burr had influence equal to men in society upon learning, or was she unique to the time? Ah, well, <laughs> interesting question. I mean, her, her great friend, Marie St. Paul, um, founded Pembroke College not long after in Cambridge again. Um, I really couldn't say it was, it was unusual for a woman to have as many books as she left um, in her will. Um, good question, but I, I, you know, I really don't know enough more about that. I mean, she was. I mean, I mean, she was incredibly wealthy and 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 was close to um, to the royal family and. Um, and and uh, subsequent no, su subsequent visits weren't there to Claire from from the monarchy. So presumably having those kinds of links would have made would have given her a, a degree, you know, a high degree of influence. Anyway, I mean, I do, do you think that by learning, but did she kind of did she set us? Do, does it did it set her apart? Do you think in some way? Well, um, she, she she wasn't in court much. Right. I mean, she, she she didn't participate at, at, at that level, um, and she certainly um, w was much more involved in education than either of her sisters, who seemed to be more interested in in land and and wealth. Um, it's 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 an interesting question. I just. I, can't can't help more on that i'm afraid <laughs> I, I think there's a really I interesting there's some really interesting trends in powerful women in the medieval period and i wish there were more of those stories being told um based in lincoln nicola de la Haye in the 13th century defends lincoln castle for three weeks when it's under siege and it's the one of only two castles in england that are withstanding standing up against the french taking over the throne um and uh, yet a century earlier um, Matilda fighting Stephen in the Civil War had encountered a huge amount of hostility for being too overly male, but the barons had all agreed to her becoming uh, king, as it were, because queen really meant the wife of the king, so you couldn't be, you know, the, the barons had agreed to her being ruler while Henry was still alive, Henry I was still alive. So I think it's all very pragmatic. I think in the 14th century, I mean, there's a, in fact, a, a, somebody who would have known um, uh, Elizabeth de Burr, uh, Isabella of France, you know, Edward oh, II's queen, you know, is is conducting a war on, you know, leading a war effectively. So we, you, you sort of get the feeling that women could take power if they, if it was pragmatic, pragmatically manageable. Nicola de la Haye is the first ever female county sheriff, but John makes her sheriff because he hasn't got any King John hasn't got any other friends, really, you know, nobody else he could rely on. It's a really interesting question, though. Well, Elizabeth did stand up to, to Edward II, um, um, and 
she supported Isabella. Uh, well, <laughs> I can imagine they might have had quite a lot in common. <laughs> yes, 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 I think they did. Um, well, very often they did. There were there are other examples of of defending castles when their husbands are away or have you know and 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 the other thing. Margaret she, Paston sort of looking much later. The other thing she did was was, was take a vow of chastity after her third husband so that she could avoid being married off yet again to one of Edward II's um, favorites. I mean, really your best career as a woman in the medieval period was widowhood. Uh, I, I think one has yeah, to. <laughs> yeah, 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 yes, yes. Thank you. Um, I've got a question from Keith who had to leave earlier on and he, I mean, he came up with some interesting comments in in the chat but he but one of his questions was and i'm not sure who'd be best place um to answer this probably probably you peggy but i'm not quite sure um but he was saying my theory is that the name of claire comes from clears in normandy mm. and he wondered if there was any evidence um for for such a for that sort of a link um in the, i mean we haven't obviously found anything in the archaeology but i mean it does make you wonder where I mean, was it called Claire when when El when 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 Elfgar had it uh, was in, um, um, in charge? So, so now, who who asked this question? Uh, this is Keith Keith Briggs. Yes, but he wrote the article. <laughs> he he wrote the only source of information I have about oh right okay. the name of Claire. Um, yeah, and he certainly explored some of the the, the French connections. Um, I think I think Doomsday is the first time we've seen the name Clarum. Right. Um, um, and I don't think we have any evidence about what it was called when Alfred or his son Whitgar um, uh, were in charge. Um, the name at all? No. Uh, I'm just surprised he asked the question. <laughs> I think probably he's interested in whether any any you know whether there is anything else has come has come about you know whether the whether the or whether we found anything actually in the archaeology well obviously we haven't found anything in the archaeology really yet because we haven't really in terms of what we've dug so far we haven't really got back um beyond we haven't got back beyond the norman the norman period yet i mean it's that big that trench that we're going to reopen that we didn't finish last year is where we've got the real potential of to going right the way through the layers and you know and finding out but i'm not sure that we're going i'm not quite sure that that's the sort of evidence we are very likely to find unless by some miracle we get some something with writing on it which is well not very likely i, I would have thought it was the, there's there's a general link of course with the normans in the, the french norman um families because it, you know there's a modern bailey castle built there and we know that there's a norman lord who took over the uh yeah the the, the territory um so we've got that general link well the you know the, the family at the conquest wasn't called claire oh, but no. this, the yeah. place was clearly called claire by then, by the looks of it, there's no suggestion in Doomsday it was called something else before then. So it must have had that name before the conquest, I would I would assume, because the, the TRE, the Tempest Rex, says Wadio, it doesn't say the name's different. Um, but that doesn't mean there isn't a connection. You know, you've got lords are holding yeah. lands across, you know, there's lots of connections, but it would be very difficult to prove it, even if we found some French pottery from that part of Normandy that would still only show a generic connection. Um, I think that's more of a genealogist's uh, nightmare to try and untangle. Uh, I haven't read Richard's article, so I, you're ahead of me, Peggy, on that one. Keith's article, yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm going to, I've now got a question here, um, probably for Carenza, um, from Rachel Halter. Do we have a lot of evidence for settlements without cemeteries or churches, or is it just the case that all settlements had a church of some sort and therefore a cemetery? She apologises <laughs> if it's a silly question, but it doesn't seem like a silly question at all to me. It seems like a very sensible one. Always, whenever anybody apologises for asking a silly question, it's always a really good question. Um, and I reckon any question, anybody, you know, if it hasn't been made clear, it's, it's an interesting question, unless it's involving anything supernatural. Well, anything, little green men from Mars and all that sort of thing. Anyhow, <laughs> I digress. Um, 
the question about settlements having cemeteries, um, it depends how big your settlement is, basically. So by the time you get to about the year 1000, um, most of today's parish churches, um, or most of the sort of uh, medieval parish churches, would have been in situ on that location. It, it's generally thought Richard Morris reckons. So um, most uh, settlements of any size um, in somewhere like England would have had a church probably by about the year 1000, it would have been a parish church. So that would have meant any settlements that were at the sort of parish centre would have had a church, but actually in areas of dispersed settlement, where instead of one big nucleated village or one sort of uh, town, um, you've got a sort of scatter of settlement through the landscape where you've just got farms studded along rural lanes um, and little clusters of cottages, perhaps around greens. Um, and there's plenty of Suffolk that has a settlement pattern very like that. Um, many of those smaller settlements wouldn't have had their own church nearby. Um, in some cases, you get a sort of proliferation of moated sites. So instead of moated sites, which are sort of down the, down the line, as it were, from, from Motton Bailey's, so the next sort of a little bit later, um, but again, they're seigneurial lordly sites. Some parishes, you just get one of those, and it's the one lord that's living often very close to the church, is probably the patron of the church in the main settlement, and you've got the combination of church, manor, and settlement all together. In other places, the so counties like Bedfordshire, you get some, some parishes will have five or ten moated sites and some of those may have cemeteries with them we, we don't tend to find them so we did some digging in Sharnbrook in Bedfordshire and again in a small enclosure we didn't find any burials there but we did only do a two meter square test pit so I wouldn't say we kind of exactly exhausted its possibility for that but interestingly that enclosure was I should think seven or eight hundred meters from the church so it's quite a long way away so in answer to the question all of the bigger settlements at parish centres would have had churches with them. Um, but there is a thought that many more of these seigneurial lordly sites may well have had burial sites with them at the end of the Anglo-Saxon period before the Norman Conquest um, by about the year 1000. Thank you. Right, I think that's pretty much it for the questions that we've got. Um, there is a question here about um, the digging, which I think is probably one to come back on me. Um, I'm sure you're all aware we, we start digging on the 20th. We've got an open day on the 3rd of October, Sunday, the 3rd of October. And I've got a question here about what are we, what are we hoping to discover next month um, at Clare? And well, after, after Carenza's talk, we're hoping to discover a church for sure. <laughs> um, we, we, that was always the reason why we put the big trench in by the good shed. And we're going to reopen that trench and expand it a little bit and try and, and really get this. We know we've got a really good sequence of stratified deposits. So we're going, we want to go through that and get all the way through it and to the bottom. And, um, and I, I believe, Carenza, you, you found potential pre, prehistoric um, archeology span right at the base of your sequences. So it would be really great if we can go all the way through that and, and, um, and get, get the entire sequence. And then we've got, um, other questions really that or most of which do relate either to um, the size of the cemetery or the date of the cemetery and the relationship of the cemetery with the castle earthworks which we want to try and, and, and have a look at and just to have a look at how some of the cut archaeology relates to some of the features that we can we know um, our castle features as opposed to something that, that could be earlier so those are the kinds of questions that we're um, that we're looking, uh, we're looking to address in this year's digging, which um, I'm really looking forward to. I'm taking a little bit of holiday so I can get actually get properly stuck in myself. So that will be that'll be really uh, really good fun. Um, so on that, um, I'm just going to just a few bits of information actually about the about the webinar itself. It has been recorded, and the recording will be it will there'll be some minor editing and things to be done and then that will be available and i'm i'm pretty sure and i'm sure someone will 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 tell me if not but that that will the link for that will be emailed round to everybody who has signed up for the webinar so you will be um you will be told when when the um when the recording is going is going to be available um and i just I did have a chance to have a proper look at the chat and I'm 
um, and just see all the messages that we got from people um, who have attended. And I'm I'm really blown away by the range of places that people have come from and that they're interested in finding out about this. And just to run through it, we've got Canada, United States, we've got Armagh, we've got Orkney, India, lots of people from Clare and Suffolk and Essex, but Hampshire, Yorkshire, Somerset, Gloucestershire, um, and all so all over the country and from you know all over the world and and quite a few people whose names that whose names I recognize I know I've se we've seen them in several of our other um, webinars as well so it's really really good to have people who are you know with whom we 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 some old friends and people we can build relationships I think is is really great and a really really good way in which we can um, pull in this expertise that we get by having people like um, Carenza and Peggy without without Carenza being able to be here tonight from Glasgow is, you know, it's it's just a fantastic way of of operating. And obviously, we we don't want to give up all the face to face, but we we have to see this as another um, really good opportunity to to engage with each other much more widely. So, um, thank I just want to say thank you really to absolutely everybody um, for attending. It's really really gratifying um, to have had such an audience. Um, but of course. We wouldn't have any of it if it hadn't been for Carenza and Peggy and, and their really fantastic and inspiring lectures that they've given us tonight. And we can't unfortunately do proper applause, but um, if you haven't if you haven't seen it, there's lots and lots of things coming through the chat, thanking you very much and saying what you know what a great time we've all had. So take this um, this all as your as your round of applause, a very big round of applause, uh, and my great thanks to both of you for um, for for doing this. And I'd also like to just thank the person behind the scenes who's who's been who's made it all happen, whose face we haven't seen. And that's my colleague, um, Kaz Adams, who's Cotswold Archaeology's Outreach Officer. Those of you who are um, either at Clare or have been digging at Rendlesham will actually see Kaz in person every now and again. Um, so I shall make sure that you you get introduced to her. But she's really been um, she's been in the, the, the webinar cockpit, pulling all the technology together. Um, she's um, trying uh, make, ensuring everything runs smoothly and she's the person who will make sure that we get the recording and I think there were some um, questions for uh, about subtitles and I don't know if Kaz actually managed to solve them um, du during the, the presentation but if not we'll certainly going to have a look at that and see if we can get uh, there's anything we can build into the recording I'm not promising anything because I am completely not technological and I could be Kaz might be there in the background with her head in her hands now as I'm saying these things. So I'm not promising anything, but certainly something that we shall um, something that we shall we shall look at. Um, and just as I've said, we'll be starting the final season of excavations on the 20th of September with the open day on the 3rd of October. We'll be posting updates on social media and the website. So keep an eye, keep an eye on that. And finally, I'm afraid there's one very, very small task for you before you go away. And that is, we'd really like to know what you thought about tonight's online event. We're still very much in the learning process of putting these things together. And we'd be really grateful if you'd fill in a very brief survey. It's only three or four questions that so doesn't take very long, but it will just help us because we don't get to see it from your perspective. We only get to see it from ours. So um, if there are, you know, we, obviously we want to know that you really enjoyed yourself and you thought it was fantastic. But if you've got any other constructive comments, then we'll really um, appreciate getting those. Um, so that's everything from me. Um, once again, thank you so much to Carenza and Peggy. And thank you to all of you for coming along. And I hope that we'll see you at the next webinar, whenever that may be. So thank you very much and good night. Thank you.